My name is Sinek, and I'm here to talk about abstractions and the notion of Pythonic code. And like a lot of things that I create, it's coming from a place of frustration because I see repeatedly postulated in public that lists of tuples of dictionaries are the epitome of Pythonic code. It's a virtuous ideal that we all should strive for. And everything else is either Java-like, which is code for I do not like it, or over-engineered, which is code for I don't understand the trade-offs and I'm gonna dismiss it wholesale. Now, software engineering, of course, has a name for this. It's called primitive obsession. And it's considered a code smell because it makes it much harder to understand the intent of your code. It also makes your code less expressive. And Python is very expressive. I write quite a bit of Go too. And whenever I do that, I miss list comprehensions. I miss context managers, all those nice goodies we have. But for some reason, people tend to pull the emergency abstraction break right after the language features. And there are many reasons for that. Uh, one of the main one is performance because tuples and dicts are, they are really fast. Like dictionaries in Python, they are everywhere. Whenever you add two numbers, you create probably at least three dictionaries along the way. But declaring this a virtuous ideal also has a name and it's of course premature optimization, which of course, as we know from this grumpy gentleman, is the root of all evil. So today I want to encourage you to embrace high level abstractions so your code becomes more expressive, more readable, easier to debug, and ultimately more correct. And I will start with the simple fact that Python is a very high level language. So it means that you are already paying the performance tax. So when you're doing that, you could just as well make full use of it. And if performance is so important that you have to micro optimize everything, um, that you write some kind of assembly hidden inside of Python, Python may be the wrong language for the task you are trying to solve. Now, let's look at a few examples of good abstractions. And um, they are especially valuable for messy topics, for topics that you don't know enough about, or even worse, where you don't know what you don't know. And we will start with one of those very deceiving examples, which are files. In 2009, David Beeler wrote almost 30,000 words on the topic of the problems with Unix file names. 30,000. I think it's safe to assume that Windows support adds another 30,000 easily. And the interoperation between Unix and Windows, it's probably another 300,000. And sure, there are tools in OS.path, but it's much nicer to actually separate the information like path components and drives from its representation, which are flat strings. And this is exactly what Pathlib does. Pathlib is in a standard library since Python 3.4, which for some reason still feels very fresh to me, but actually it's kind of ancient. It's so old that it's not supported anymore. And it gives you this nice idiomatic syntax of creating paths. And you use the same APIs on, on Linux and on Windows, and it just abstracts away the, the differences. And then you just access the data you want to know. One nice Easter egg that many don't know about is that with Pathlib, you can actually read a file using one line only. So this, this line will open, read, and close the file and return you uh, the contents as a Unicode string. Now, another example of something that is terrible as a string are IP addresses, especially IPv6. I mean, do you know all the normalization rules for IPv6 addresses? I certainly don't. Um, how about checking if an address is part of a network? In this case, it's very simple, but there are more complicated instances of networks and uh, it still is terrible to use strings for this kind of checks. And the IP address uh, module is actually in Python, even since Python 3.3, which is like not just ancient, this is like uh, prehistoric. And let's talk about the thing that unites uh, paths and IP addresses, which are URLs. And are also we are ent entering web development territory here. So URLs, they are not only hard, but they are also very dangerous. If you run a public web server in any, in any way, you probably have seen something like this. This is a permanent barrage of examples what happens 
if someone handles URLs wrong. These are all bots scanning for bugs in URL handling. And of course, Python comes with uh, the URL parse module. And this is a very old API, like very old. It was added in 1994, so it's safe to assume that many of you are actually younger than this API. And it looks like it. Like there's a lot of clutches around it that cannot break backward compatibility. Actually, Python 3.8.2 had been delayed because they uh, fixed something to be more correct, but it broke assumptions around the ecosystem. They had to revert it. So what I personally prefer is called YARL. It's coming from the AIO HTTP project, but uh, it's a separate project on PyPI that you can install using pip. And you can instantiate your URL using, uh, by parsing it. And then you can just access all the different parts however you want. And uh, you can, of course, add path components the same way like in pathlib. And every object that you get back is immutable, which is nice. You can also replace the whole thing if you want to. Now, once you get used to this kind of expressivity when creating and parsing URLs, you never want to deal with strings again. And as a nice extra, many libraries nowadays accept URLs for configuration. So you can serialize all information that you need to connect to a server into one string. And you can then just pass the string to, for example, the Redis client library or to SQL Alchemy, which has supported URLs forever, or Django. There are uh, at least PyPI packages that do that for you. And this is a really nice practice because if you serialize all information to one string and keep it in one place, you have a much a smaller risk of information drift between, for example, your configuration management and your secret storage. Now, speaking of passing arguments, let's assume you have a function and you want to tell the function about a mutually exclusive option. Basically, you want to tell it either A, B, or C, but only one of them. So what you can do is that you take three bools that are false by default, and the user has to set one of them true. Now, you have to make a short runtime that the user passes exactly one of them. And you're also forcing keyword style arguments on your users, although there's really just one argument to be had. So this is not ideal. Another thing that I've seen commonly is to pass strings. But again, you have to verify at runtime. And it also rubs me very much the wrong way because this looks like I'm passing some kind of data, not telling it about an option. And this, um, and one thing that should really be stressed that your function, once you take strings, becomes a parser. And as my friend David McEver said, this is not a great thing because uh, parsers, especially when stuff gets more complicated, can get very ugly. And I've seen both approaches that I've showed you in popular Python packages. So let's look at something better. And again, the solution is in the standard library. And again, since Python 3.4, that was a really good vintage. So, the answer are enums. They allow you to define the valid values that you want to take uh, in your function, and then you just call it with those values. And this is not only much more idiomatic, typos get also uh, caught with a much more idiomatic error because will, you get an attribute error. And you get free type checking. So uh, you just define your function that it takes a what. And now if you try to call it with a non-existing member of what, you don't have to run it to get an error. MyPy will tell you that this attribute does not exist. And this is something to note. Good abstractions ideally make it impossible to make mistakes. But uh, the second best case, they allow you to catch the errors earlier using static checking, not at runtime, not at a runtime cost. So what this also means is that it's possible that your hyper-efficient strings and tuples and dicts actually slower in production because you have more parsing and invariance to care about than uh, if you had proper abstractions here. And it's definitely harder to uh, debug. Now, this is a web conference. So let's look at a concrete web example. Some frameworks allow you to return a dictionary, which then becomes automatically JSON. This sounds really great until you have more than one view and maybe the structure isn't as simple which is almost always the true for me because I'm a big fan of the JSON API standard. So this example would already look something like this, which I grant you looks somewhat over-engineered in a simple case, but I can assure you that for complex APIs, 
it's God sent for both your users that always know what to expect and how to navigate your API and for you because you have less bikes, uh, bike shedding because you know how the structure is defined, it's set in stone. You may not love it, but you don't have to decide on it. This is, uh, this is really nice. Now, I hope you can see that it becomes unwieldy basically immediately. Uh, this doesn't even include error handling or post data. And being unhappy with existing solutions, I wrote my own little framework. Uh, so my views nowadays look like this. They just return objects that are then serialized and wrapped by middleware. And same goes with my um, error helpers. As you can see, there's much less boilerplate. It is much less error prone. The, function, the view does not care about how the JSON looks that's coming back. It just cares about what data is in it. And it's also nicely typed, as you can see. So how about validation? Well, as you can see, my views received the body already validated in a typed class. And by validated, I mean just uh, structure and syntax. So I personally use uh, Voluptuous in the background, which is a terrible name for a package, but it is still the best validation framework that we have. And I can basically raise a validation error anywhere I want. Uh, the middleware will just catch it and transform it into proper JSON and API responses and errors. And then the business rules live in the service layer. And what it does, it really just calls into the service layer and then translates the return values and the errors into something that the user can uh, deal with. And as you can see, there's zero, zero boilerplate, there's zero code duplication. And the view itself, again, does not care how the response is structured. You're just passing around information and the middleware cares about how to serialize it. Now, we also have proper types, which of course avoids certain errors. It also avoids duplication because this decorator just looks at the, um, at the type hints of the view and then extracts the necessary validator automatically. So again, zero duplication. Um, I hope you realize how wonderfully testable all of this is because it just composes and how easily can this be expanded for other topics like open API schema generation and things like that. But types aside, nothing about this is really new. Like Armin Ronacker talked about this kind of views in, in his talk in 2016. So, um, but I still don't see such approaches talked about widely, but maybe at this conference. Now, I could go on and talk about concepts that people use primitives type for, but shouldn't. For example, money. I believe it's a rite of passage as a programmer that at some point in time you use floats to represent money and are surprised about the results. Or version numbers that look like numbers, but are actually much more complicated. But let's move on from abstractions over data and over to abstractions over state and control flow. And I want to briefly talk about finite state machines. And I understand that Calvin is going to give a talk on this topic specifically to Django later. So you can kind of see this as a little preparation for his talk. And what we're going to do is to model a very simple turnstile. And you start by defining the finite amount of states, hence the name. And in this case, a turnstile can be locked or unlocked. And these are the circles. Now we define the transition between those states using arrows. And those transitions happen based on inputs, which are the labels on the arrows. So if, you, if the turnstile is locked and you insert a coin, it goes over to unlocked. If it's unlocked and you push through, it goes from unlocked to locked. Now, if you are unlocked and add more money, it will stay unlocked. And if it's locked and you push harder, it will, if it's doing its job well, uh, stay uh, locked. Now, this is a very simplistic example, but having this abstraction that defines the valid inputs, enforces the states and the transitions between them based on the inputs, saves you a huge nested and error-prone if-then-else tree. And this is a high-level abstraction, so it takes some work to grok it. And maybe you're already wondering, how would you even implement that, like in a generic way? Uh, but especially server software is full of state machines and often they are just implied and that makes them really brittle and really buggy. In Python, as far as I'm concerned, I know about the automat 
project, which is pro definitely production ready. It's used widely in the Twisted projects, but it still takes some time to grok on how you approach such a problem. And you might be still tempted to just do an ad hoc if then else trip in the sake of simplicity. But it's important to understand that if then else is not simple. It is easy because it is familiar to you and that it's a familiar tool that you have used a lot, but it actually increases the complexity of your code. And there's a whole talk about this by Rich Hickey, the in inventor of Clojure called Simple Made Easy. And if you haven't seen it yet, you should definitely watch it because it will change your view on these kind of concepts. Now, I hope that I'm somewhat established that abstractions are good for you. Now, what do all these examples have in common? They use classes. And I think it's fair to say that Python's relationship with classes is somewhat strained. You may even have seen the seminal talk by Jack Diederich from 2012, where he urged us to stop writing classes. Now, if you actually watch the talk, you will realize that he asked you to stop writing classes that consist of one method, which was much more common back then when most Python programmers were actually reformed Java programmers. And we just weren't used to have functions at all. Now, a few months later, Armin Dronacker chimed in and told us the opposite. To start, more, to start writing more classes. So now, who's right? Another month had to pass until Evie summed it up swimmingly by telling us to stop writing stupid classes. So it turns out both were right. And it turns also out that writing good classes and having a good separation of concerns is really, really hard. I still struggle with it myself. And almost all books on programming have bad classes and bad advice on how to structure your classes. By the way, except this one. And I think Harry and Bob did some outstanding work for, to the Python community to, to write it. And you, I think you should all read it. Um, I suggest to buy it so they write more books, but it, you can actually read it for free on the web. So take advantage of this. It's an amazing book. Now, in the end, of course, as with everything, it's a trade-off, like the essence of engineering. And you have to decide what's right in your situation for your use case. But in any case, classes are invaluable for rich abstractions. There's no way around that. So let's accept classes as necessary and talk about the more technical part of the equation. Because until recently, writing well-behaved classes was a chore because you had to implement a bunch of Dunder methods and uh, it was not fun. For those who hear Dunder for the first time, uh, it's a contraction of double and under. And they're also called uh, magic methods sometimes. It's the same thing. Now, the problem with those methods is they look almost the same for all classes. It's basically just busy work and they all look the same and it's very hard to spot the differences and uh, spot the bugs. So you have to basically write the same tests for all classes and it's really unpleasant. And it is so bad that some people think that this is desirable and idiomatic Python. Sure, let's just subclass a name tuple. And this is not from some extremist block or something. This uh, I've taken verbatim from the standard library documentation. And the problem, of course, like among other problems, your class is still a tuple. So your class behaves like a tuple, which means that you can accidentally iterate over it or you can accidentally unpack it. You have the name point in your hierarchy twice. So no way this could be confusing when debugging, right? Long story short, this looks like a class, but it does not behave like a class. It's an ad hoc hack to save typing which makes it a very poor match for production code, in my opinion. Now, but we lived with that for many years, myself included. Um, but then one day in 2014, I started working on a security sensitive projects that needed proper classes to meaningfully represent um, different types of data that I found in certificates and the behavior on top of that types of data. And it became clear to me, especially after dabbling with other languages, that something is missing from Python, a language that I've been using and loving since 2008. I realized that Python's classes are a drag and that our code has become worse for that reason. Because in hindsight, this informed the decision of so many projects in Python, including the prevalence of huge God objects and primitive obsession, because it's just annoying to write a class. 
Now, it's not my nature to accept that, which is why I'm sad and stressed all the time. And I've implemented a class decorator to implement those dunders based on a declarative config. So my first attempt, which was called characteristic, didn't go great. And I hope nobody of you have heard of it, although it has been used quite a bit. I've made some questionable choices, including the name, but I used it a lot. I got annoyed a lot. I misspelled it a lot, but I learned a lot too. So eventually, in a delirious chat with Glyph, which was, I think, like 4 a.m. in the morning for him, I came up with a nice way to define attributes that are idiomatic, clear, and you may have heard of it. This is adders. This is literally the history of adders, how it came to be. I needed to write a lot of classes and I was too lazy. This is how great software comes to be. Now, this point class that you see here has all the methods that you'd expect and everything you need to know, you see at one glance and you just add your own methods. And otherwise it's a regular class. You can step through the dunder in it with PDB. We've made sure that this is always possible. And the class belongs to you once address is done. Like there's not, no magic going behind. Now, this was April 2015. And it was life-changing for everyone who was trying to write solid object-oriented code, like solid with all capital letters. Because it meant less friction when you're trying to separate your concerns. And if there's like one lesson in this talk that I can give you for life is that trying harder is never the solution to anything. Like you have to find the points of friction and you have to remind, remove that friction and then things can improve. Now, in the beginning, we thought that adders is just going to be a quick way to create classes, which is why we thought that we're going to get away with this cute adder.s and adder.ip, which of course are abbreviation for adders, attribute, and adrip attribute. But it grew a lot over the years and it grew many, many features. Things like adder.factory, which makes me angry whenever I see it, because it makes no sense. But today it exceeded 25 million downloads per, per month. So, and it's orbiting Earth on a satellite, which is like my biggest achievement ever. So it is a success story in a certain sense, but the story doesn't end here because the story took an important turn in 2017. Shortly after PyCon US, I was approached by Hiro van Rossum while I was actually waiting for my flight to, um, to the US and he asked me for a meeting at PyCon to discuss how we might provide some of Adder's functionality to future standard libraries versions. Now you should know that Guido was always very open about how he did not like Adder's. So this was, was kind of nice that we uh, tried to find a way. So I've met him and Eric Smith and to, to, together we sketched out design of what would become PEP557. Now what is PEP557? That is of course data classes in Python 3.7. So if you've ever wondered if there's a relationship between adders and data classes or why adders even exist, this is the answer. And I'm saying it because some people have spread rumors otherwise. Now, people ask for something like adders in a standard library and I've worked with Guido and Eric to give it to them. The nice thing is though that uh, the relationship has been bidirectional because some ideas in data classes went back into adders. So first class typing support, for example, adders shipped at first because we have no schedule to abide, but the idea came from data classes. And I'm gonna claim that typing in Python only took off because tools like data classes and adders gave those types much more power than just a pop-up in an IDE. So all I have to say is you can have classes now without installing a third party dependency, which begs the question, of course, why errors? Why install something? Why am I even still uh, spending time on that? And while the question is fair, it of course always hurts when someone asks it, but uh, I'm gonna answer it anyway. So there are reasons and you have to decide for yourself if they are relevant. So firstly, we still support Python 2.7, which is up to you to decide if that's good or bad, but a lot of people need that. Uh, we support slots like slotted classes, which means they, they need a lot less memory and they are slightly faster to instantiate and they are protected from assigning attributes that do not exist on the class. So it helps you to catch typos. Now, some people really hate types and um, in others, types are optional, they always will be. And um, 
Then we have runtime validators and converters, which we run for you in the Dunder init, which allows for re really nice tools that have been built around it. But most importantly, we are free to innovate at any time. We are not bound to Python's release schedule or backward compatibility promises, although we do feel the drag of 25 million donors per month. So this is where our poorly chosen package name serves us somewhat because we plan to introduce a new address namespace this year. So this is how it's supposed to look like. And yes, there is an S and no, there are no more punny abbreviations. It will have better defaults that we cannot change anymore for backward compatibility. And the old namespace stays in place, which gives you a better experience and no breakage whatsoever to old time users. So I hope that this is how address code is gonna look at in 2020. So uh, long story short, I want you to embrace abstractions. They will help you to write better code. I hope I've shown you how much better your code can look if you go the extra mile. I want you to stop being afraid of classes unless, unless they have just one method and um, to use the tools to, to lessen the friction, um, to lessen the friction to write them. There are quite a bit of them nowadays. It's not just adders and data classes, it's also Pydentic and some others. And finally, of course, I want you to ask to wear your masks because this shit ain't over by a long run. So this is all I have for you. Uh, so you find all the links I've mentioned in uh, this link or the QR codes, which might not work because there's my hat. Uh, follow me on Twitter, get your domains from Vario Media if you speak German. I'm Hinek, Black Lives Matter. Thank you very much.